مسلم دو يهدف إلى تعريف المسلمين بالمراكز الإسلامية يعرف يهدف إلى تعريف المسلمين بالمدارس الإسلامية يهدف إلى تعريف المسلمين في كندا بداية ثم المسلمين في شمال أمريكا وإن شاء الله المسلمين المتحدثين والناطقين باللغة الإنجليزية في العالم من مثل أستراليا ونيوزيلندا وكندا وأمريكا والمسلمين في ماليزيا وفي الهند وفي أستراليا وفي أي دولة يتحدث بها المسلمون اللغة الإنجليزية هذا التطبيق فيه تذكير فيه توضيح فيه شرح فيه تعريف فيه تعريف لك إن كنت تتنقل في كندا أين هي المساجد أوقات الصلاة فيه تعريف لك في منطقتك ما المسجد الذي تحب أن ترتبط به بأوقات الصلاة سواء صلاة الفرض أو عفوا سواء المواعيد الصلاة الفرض أو مواعيد الإقامة النشاطات المحاضرات الدورات التدريبية وإن أحببت أن تسهم بدعم مركزك أو مسجدك أو مدرستك أو أحببت أن تسهم بدعم فعالية أو نشاط معين في هذه المدرسة أو هذا المركز فالباب متاح لك بلمسة زر فقط فهي تسهيل وتوضيح وتعريف ونشر وإبداع في هذا الأمر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome back to our sixth and final episode So الحمد لله شاء الله We covered a lot of stuff in the past few weeks And for today's episode I decided to cover something that um, many of us may have questions about Um, something that I'm currently studying and ex- uh, experiencing as a therapist intern. So inshallah, uh, you all benefit. And the topic today is about the benefits of therapy. Um, let's talk about kind of its origins. How do we understand therapy from an Islamic perspective? And uh, to start us off, uh, I want to preface this by saying that this is not an invitation to everybody that, you know, therapy is the best solution and the only solution possible. No. This is just an explanation about the benefits of it and what you can gain from it, inshallah, if you do um, decide to pursue it as a form of healing, inshallah. Um, and then to start off with another point, um, the idea that our community as Muslims looks at therapy with a little bit of critical lens. Um, they see it maybe as nonsense or it's for crazy people or that it's not effective or it's unnecessary. Um, and that's because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what therapy is actually about. You might see it on TV or on media portrayed in different ways. So inshallah, I hope this presentation can give you a taste of um, what you can expect if you pursue therapy, inshallah. Um, I wanted to also get, given our theme over the past few um, episodes, I uh, ground this in Islamic psychology. So uh, as we discussed earlier, talk therapy actually originated from Muslims. And this was an effort um, taken by Muslim scholars because they were deeply interested in the soul, the nafs, which are the behavioral inclinations, they really wanted to understand what self-improvement looks like. And that was the birth of Islamic psychology in, in general. And one example I wanted to draw to your attention of how Muslim scholars since the year 868, like Al-Jahil, they talked about kind of uh, using strategies to reduce sadness and misery when talking with others, for example, when talking with, some, with somebody who has lost a son or a father. Uh, what are some of the tools that the person can use to reduce the misery and the sadness within that person? And if you read those books, if you read the original books that these people wrote, you realize how similar they are to the idea of cognitive behavior therapy, which is, you know, very popular nowadays. It's like, you know, coined just like a hundred years ago, but still has so much popularity. Um, and if you're interested in going back and seeing what, you know, where did Al-Jahab talk about this? It's in Kitab Al-Bayan and Al-Tabin. page uh, 74, inshallah. But yeah, that's just an interesting example about how our own Muslim scholars used talk therapy years before it was ever coined by the West. But aside from talk therapy, there are also core elements in Islam that help us kind of um, heal and approach kind of change through, you know, just submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the two that I wanted to highlight that are sometimes incorporated in therapy, but can also be found beyond uh, the therapeutic context, is awe and repentance. So let's start with awe. And I love I love talking about the idea of awe or in Arabi, uh, rahba. Um, it's basically like a, a study in West, uh, from Western psychology in the past maybe five years. So this was a study done in University of Toronto by researcher Steller. Um, they basically looked at the feeling of uh, awe in comparison to all other positive emotions, such as gratitude, joy, happiness. And they found that Awe specifically was unlike all the other emotions. Um, they found that people who experience awe 
such as, for example, looking at a beautiful, breathtaking scenery or like a tall structure, um, that leads them to be more altruistic, which basically means that they were kinder to others, they were more helpful to others, and they were more pro-social in general. But not just that, even if these people experience negative awe, which means something like you know, fear or being shaken, like you saw something like that, you know, shook your bones and you're like, wow, you know, like, you know, the, the hairs on your, or on your body, like just stand up. Even that feeling also leads to pro-social behaviors. So not just the positive feeling of awe, but also the negative feeling leads to um, people wanting to help others and wanting to be kinder to others. So think about that in the context of, you know, not just life around us, like the beautiful earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us on, but also within the Qur'an itself and how sometimes verses of the Qur'an can elicit those feelings of awe within us, um, both negative and positive awe. So it's just really like interesting to think about and look at um, and how Western psychology arrived at it so late and we had this information with us for so many years. Um, the second piece is tawbah and repentance. And a lot of the reasons that people come to therapy is most likely kind of dealing with um, mistakes that they've done in the past or just things in their life that they want to address that they're unsure that they're deserving of forgiveness for. So uh, the idea, the basic idea of tawbah is basically resolving your guilt and offering you a way to you know, escape the harsh self-critical thoughts or sometimes the thoughts that come from shaitan by you know, giving you a way, like here's how you can make it better. And when you incorporate these concepts within the therapeutic context or within the, the journey of healing in general, um, that's inshallah where you can find most um, effective results. So those are just some pieces I wanted to highlight. Um, so if like assuming that you know, inshallah therapy is effective, how do we know which type of therapy or which form of therapy is more effective than the rest? Or how do I know that you know something can, you know, something like therapy can actually help me? Um, so interestingly, psychologists and researchers also wanted to answer this question of you know how therapy is effective and which ones are effective. And they did, like a, uh, they did a lot of research in the middle of the 1900s, so the past um, 50 to 100 years, uh, because a lot of therapies were emerging at that time and people just wanted to know, you know which ones are actually backed up by evidence uh, and which ones are just you know, fluff and hocus pocus. Um, so they found that across all the effective therapies, the ones that are showing effective and real results, like maybe cognitive behavior therapy, solution-focused therapy, emotion-focused, they found that across all of them, you know, regardless of which approach you're taking, the one factor that seems to be leading to the change is the therapeutic alliance. And the therapeutic alliance basically is the trust or the bond between the therapist and the patient or the client. Um, and this basically involves, you know, the, the trust, feelings of compassion, feelings of empathy, feelings of just being heard and being listened to, like genuinely heard, as opposed to others, you know, just, you know, casually listening and giving, you know, surface level advice. Um, the person also finds it helpful when the therapist is sensitive to their culture, to their religious um, identity, and to their uh, spiritual identity. So having that in mind as well, um, has been, like, it's been shown in the research that this also is a factor in helping creating effective um, therapy outcomes. So this is just kind of helpful to think about if you're considering doing therapy, uh, if you think this is a uh, space for you, um, that you know, when you're looking for a therapist, it can be wise to think about all of the things that can help you build that therapeutic alliance, including maybe whether or not they're Muslim or that they're trained in um, Islamic, um, Islamic psychology. Um, yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about kind of the importance of therapy in the context of a world where we're giving a lot of um, med like prescriptions to people. So we're seeing that a lot of medical doctors are admi administering antidepressants or just um, yeah, um, so what's the word? Yeah, they're administering drugs or um, I'm completely, like the word is escaping my mind, but let's use drugs for now. They're administering uh, drugs for people who are not necessarily experiencing severe, severe mental illness. And that can be dangerous because that person with their symptoms currently can be maybe completely and holistically healed through just talk therapy. So what we end up doing is we end up making the patient reliant on these drugs, maybe even addicted to them. And that when, you know, they could have had a much better uh, alternative healing journey through just psychotherapy or talk therapy. So again, this is to put it in context, this is specifically speaking about people whose symptoms are not very severe and can actually benefit from just therapy alone. So it's helpful to think about it in this way, that instead of the first line of treatment being, you know, like 
somebody comes to the doctor and be like, okay, here's drugs to help me make you feel better. Considering therapy as a first line of action so that uh, we don't end up administering drugs to everybody and you know, leading to even further problems such as addiction or heavy reliance on these drugs. Um, the, another, like, another theme that is also important is that therapy is accessible by everybody. You don't need to have a diagnosis to be able to access therapy. Whereas with drugs, you do need to be diagnosed as depressed or somebody with an anxiety to be able to access these drugs to help you make you feel better, to help make you feel better. So um, aside from that uh, point as well, is that it's freeing to not have that label. It's more freedom and um, at least more trust in yourself uh, without having to be labeled as, oh, I'm depressed or, oh, I'm, I have anxiety. Um, that empowerment that you get without having that label is crucially, crucially important. And unfortunately, the way the system is built with insurance companies and drug companies that need to have a label on somebody leads to even more problems of, you know, overdiagnosis and just putting unnecessarily, unnecessary labels when the person can be healed just fine with other methods. Um, and to not lessen kind of the importance, you know, like our minds might think that mm, maybe drugs are more effective because they're actually start getting the biology. We see in research until today that talk therapy is, has a lot of transformative potential. It's not just drugs that can do the action, but a lot of people can heal and, you know, be in a better place through uh, psychotherapy. So these weekly sessions that you engage in um, can really challenge, you know, challenge your behaviors and challenge your thoughts um, into a better place that you can, you know, find healing and find um, transformation, inshallah, according to your goals. So this is basically kind of a rough overview. Again, this is not kind of telling everybody that, you know, everybody should be in therapy. Again, this is just for people who are interested in it and want to explore it. This is some of the things that um, you can consider as you explore, um, explore the potentials. And as I've done with all the previous slides, all the citations and references, if you want to go back to the original sources where this material is coming from, you can check the bottom of the slide, inshallah. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed um, these sessions um, together. I hope you all benefited. And if you enjoyed this content, if you'd like to hear more, if you have any questions or any comments or suggestions, please do reach out over um, email or any of the contact information I have. Um, thank you so much. This has been a great pleasure. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for joining us on this special episode. I want to start by uh, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity and then thanking the great people at Muslim Do for creating this platform and for facilitating important conversations that uh, affect the modern day Canadian Muslim, the average Canadian Muslim as well. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Brother Nadim Alwan. Jazakallah khairan for joining us. Brother Nadim has over 30 years of experience in the field of education, both in a teaching capacity and a management capacity uh, at the middle school level, high school level, and even the university level. He has two master's degrees. The first that uh, he completed in 1994 at Wayne State University in physics. Uh, Wayne State University is in the United States of America. His second master's degree is in leadership in education from OISE, the University of Toronto, here in Toronto, Canada. Uh, and finally, he is the founder and principal of Arisal Academy, a private Islamic school in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, which he established in the year 2009. Without further ado, Brother Nadim Alwan, let's jump right into it because we are limited for time. Uh, a lot of people that immigrate into uh, Canada in search for a better life, they're always kind of posed with this question. There's a lot of uh, different opinions, misinformation, sometimes lack of information. And the question is, in Canada, for Muslim families, are Islamic schools, you know, a pointless luxury or is it a priceless necessity? Jazakumullah khair for, you know, giving me such an opportunity and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help me to give justice to such an important topic that concerns a lot of Muslim parents when they come to an Islamic country such as Canada. To answer your question, I will approach it from three different perspectives. The Islamic, the academic, and the financial perspective. Now, all of us, before we do anything in life, we have to do our homework. We have to do it diligently, and we have to prior prioritize what is important to us. And one thing 
that very important to us as Muslims to look after our kids, to make sure that they're going to be grown in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be happy with us. Because they're in Amana. Exactly. And therefore, when we plan or when I plan to come to Canada, I ask so many questions, so many friends, how I can live in Canada, how, you know, financially, how I can survive, where I do put my kids. I did my homework and alhamdulillah, I received the best advices that if I'm coming to Canada, I have to put my kids in Islamic school. And that was 17 years ago. What about now? Life became more and more complicated, right? And that's why, you know, I would advise everyone, anyone ask me, what do you suggest for me if I'm coming to Canada? I say, you know what? You must put your kids in Islamic school. First thing important in Canada is oxygen. And after that is putting them in Islamic school before you think about your food, about your shelter. Otherwise, there is a possibility, a probability that you might lose your kids. So that's what I advise usually the people. Now, talking about their, you know, Islamic perspective, like luckily we are in a country, in our country, Canada, Alhamdulillah, Muslims, they practice their religion with a freedom. It's their right. And exactly. And nobody ha nobody forces you. I know there are some voices here and there who, you know, don't like, you know, immigrants and stuff like that. But Alhamdulillah, at least the government support our, you know, rights to live the way we, we want. So we should stick to our belief. We should stick to our language. We should not surrender, you know, those uh, stuff that Makes we came with. Exactly. And you can do both, right? You don't have to compromise your identity, Islamically, culturally. Yes. And you can embrace, you know, the Canadian values um, that most Canadian Muslims, if not all, embrace. You can do both. It's not a, you either do this or that. Exactly. And alhamdulillah, we are in a country of multi multiculturalism, like everybody can celebrate their differences without harming each other. So when we come here, we need, nobody's going to force us to assimilate. So we can live our life. We can go to masjid. We can, you know, pray. We can fast. We can have, a, a, you know, read a prayer in, in the park, you know. So Alhamdulillah, we have a freedom, unbelievable so freedom. So we not capitalize on that, right? Exactly, exactly. And... But now we have to pay attention to something like many years back, communities used to be somewhat isolated. So anything wrong happens in one community, it will not be transmitted to other communities. That's why our kids or ourselves when we were children, we did not, we were not influenced by other like communities if they have different moral views, if they didn't have, uh, if they have moral, I mean, uh, different belief system. Because you know, you rarely met them. Exactly. But right now, with the social media, with the internet, anything happens in any place in the world, it will be in a few seconds. You it know, goes around the world. Exactly. It's yeah. going to be just, you know, a, a public news. So that makes it much harder for us to raise our kids. And it requires from us to be more and more careful about how to raise our kids, where we put them. We need to be more protective, especially now in the growth of so many ideologies, such as secularism, such as like, you know, hedonism and individualism. So where our kids, they might start, especially when they come to Canada, they learn the language faster than their parents. And there will be some disconnection between the parents and the kids. You have no idea what they're learning. You have no idea. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, the parents will not be able to match, you know, or to go with the same speed. That's if they were able to learn the language. So that's where it's going to create a big gap between the kids and the parents. And that's why it makes it more necessary than ever to put him in an environment, you know, under the supervision and under the hand of, of, you know, Muslim teachers who we can trust. And those Muslim teachers, 
they can do a better job and they can thrive only in Islamic schools. Yes, there are some many Muslim teachers in public system, but they are not allowed to share their beliefs to convey the message of Islam. Due to Canada being a secular country and kind exactly. of that separation of mosque or church and state. That's that's exactly if we can just slow down, go back, <clears throat> like uh, this kind of perspective, what if someone argues, you know what? You're sheltering the child, you're creating this bubble to protect them, as you put it, and once they kind of go to university or the real world, they're shocked. They, they, they can't really navigate it. So how can we like basically protect them, but not fall, not, 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 not uh, kind of put them in a difficult situation in the future? Well, like, you know what? Let's be realistic. Now, when we have little kids, they start to crawl, they start to walk. We are very careful. We watch them. We make sure they don't fall from the stairs. So, you know, we put sometimes, you know, partitions or, you know, to prevent them from doing so. Another example, if you have a seedling of, uh, you know, if you want to plant some tomatoes, some, you know, cucumber, whatever in the backyard, and you, you buy a seedling from, you know, Costco, from Walmart, or whatever it is, what do we do, all of us? We plant that seedling, we put a stick, to, you know, to support, it. It, to support it, and then we keep watering it, you know, take nurturing care of it, it nurturing yeah. it, until it becomes at certain, you know, when it has the strength to stand alone, stand by itself, then we let it go. If that's what we're doing it with, you know, uh, plants, shouldn't we look after our kids until they become strong and ready to, to you know, to mingle with anybody from any kind of religion or beliefs or what have you. So that's why we need to invest in their deen, invest in their akhlaq, invest in them. Let them get, you know, strong. Once they are, inshallah, finish high school and they are gonna be able, you know, to socialize with others without impacting their religion, without, you know, making a difference in their identity because they are well established. Just so to make sure I'm understanding, basically, uh, the examples you give, just as we are physically protecting the child till they are able to comprehend and navigate the world, uh, it is our responsibility to protect them, empower them from an from a identity, belief, uh, behavioral perspective until they can take Care, or basically they have that moral compass or whatever and they can navigate the real world. That's exactly what I mean. Exactly. Awesome, right. awesome. JazakAllah khair. Brother Nadeem, some parents, they believe that tarbiyah and basically instilling good character and akhlaq uh, is their responsibility alone. Uh, they're the ones kind of take ca taking care of it at home. Uh, the effects of the outside are limited. Now, you having taught thousands of, uh, of students over you know the the last three decades, what can you comment on just kind of how children are affected, whether it's by peers, teachers, environment? What have you seen over the the past three decades? Well, saying that instilling tarbiya and akhlaq, the sole responsibility of the house is true, but before the child goes outside of the household. But now, if we think about our children, that they spend seven hours of their day when they are in full of energy. On average, yeah. On average. And for 20 instructional days per month, that makes it 140 hours per month. And during an academic year of 10 months, it's going to be 1,400 hours. And in 14 years of education from JK until grade 12, if we do the math, it's going to be 19,600 hours. They're going to spend it away from the parents under the supervision of Someone other else. adults. Yeah. That might be teachers, caretakers, right? And those people in mainstream schools, they don't share the same, you know, believe the same values. And not to mention the friends that they mingle with, they're coming from all walk of the world 
Many of them are not Muslim, some of them, like, you know, from different religion, or maybe they don't even believe in God, right? And that's very long time comparing to the quality time they spend at home with us. Because, you know, when they come back from school at 3 o'clock, 3.30, they are tired, they want to eat, they want to play game, they want to do their homework. And then you, as parents, you come from work at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you, you're tired, you want to take a nap, or you want to relax, you want to watch a game, and then you tell your kids, hey, take, you know, take the iPhone, take the, the iPad, and, you know, play a game. You rarely can spend time with them, like during the week. Maybe in the weekend, yes. But, you know, in those 35 hours per week, you can barely be able to ask them, what did you learn? You're competing what, with, with homework, with games, with exactly, rest. Exactly, exactly. Like, you will not be able to know what values, what other values they learned. Are these values in line with what our religion? So, saying that, instilling, you know, akhlaq and, and, and values and tarbiyah, you know, the responsibility of the house, that's, you know, uh, unfortunately, difficult, difficult to achieve. It's very possible. difficult. It's very so, difficult. So why not have a system that supports? And that's why Islamic school, they're going to play the role, you know, as, as a backup for you as family. Uh, you know, they share same values, the same, you know, uh, uh, morals. So in this situation, when they come back from school, you don't have to worry so much about what they learned. Because they're learning the academics, they're doing whatever they study, others in the mainstream schools, but on the top of that, they're learning Arabic, they're learning Quran, they're learning Islamic studies, the teacher uh, lead by examples, their friends coming from, you know, Islamic background. They're not right? facing Islamophobia exactly. and, and other exactly. problems that they would be subjugated to um, in, a, in a mainstream school. Yep. Jazakallah yep. khair. Uh, what if you know, you know your child? And they're staying away. They know who they are. They're going to public school, mainstream school, whatever. And they're staying away from, from all these kind of temptations, problems, or, or ideologies that, that uh, contradict, you know, the Islamic teachings. Um, like, is that easy for a child? Well, we need to understand and realize that kids cannot live in isolation. They have to find friends. They have to find a role model. The role model could be a teacher, could be a friend, right? So if we don't put him in a clean environment, if we don't put him in, a, in an environment conducive toward education, toward you know learning deen or teaching deen and akhlaq, then they have no choice but, but to find something. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And in this situation, you know, once they lose their compass, it's very hard to bring it back. You know, when they got astray, it's very hard to get them back. And to be honest with you, to just to tell you how much a teacher can impact students, one of my students, you know, her father, after the graduation ceremony, gave me a souvenir written on it to the candle that it burned itself to light in our way to the person who instilled in our heart the love for others, to Brother Nadim Alwan, your daughter and your student, so and so. It was an awakening. Wow, I had that much effect. Exactly, exactly. And that shows how much teachers can make difference, whether bad or good. So why would we put him in a wrong environment where other teachers from different belief systems, they have different values and if we don't put them in the right environment, they're going to choose their own friend. Because we don't know who's their friends are. Out of desperation, there. not because it's lucrative, but it's like they want friends. Exactly. And now, even if our kids were able to fit in, in non-Islamic school or in mainstream schools, but they might be bullied and they might receive Islamophobic remarks and they might witness sexual harassment. Now, there is a report published by Toronto Star, a study done by a psychologist from the Center of Addiction and Mental Health in 2008. This study was done on over than 1,800 students in 23 rural and 
urban schools in southwestern Ontario, which means our area, like Mississauga, Toronto, Hamilton, and so forth. And the results they found among those 1,800 students, 46% of the girls said they received sexual remarks or they had, you know, and 30% of students in grade 9 and 11, they said they were sexually touched or pinched from places they should not be touched. And this ratio, after a couple of years, it dropped only 2%. This is not exclusive to girls. Even boys, they were sexually harassed. They can be victims too, yeah. Exactly. So, and there are some other statistics I could not honestly utter and say it, you know, here in this interview. If you like to read more about it, this document, it's only one page. And there is another report was published in October 2021, stated that about 50% of high school students witnessed or experienced racial, uh, you know, racism. So this shows putting our children in such environment by itself is going to lower their self-esteem. They don't feel safe. Having said that, it doesn't mean that bullying does not happen in Islamic schools. But the way that Islamic schools deal with this is totally different because we employ preventative measures in order for these, uh, the bullying not to happen. Now, Islamic schools are not immune. We don't expect like Islamic schools gonna produce angels or is gonna only accept angels. We have people coming, Muslim people coming from different backgrounds, from different, you know, neighborhood. So we cannot assume that everybody is, you know, uh, uh, at the same well, stage, some of them this, come with exactly, baggage. Exactly. And we cannot claim that racism does not exist. But the point is how we deal with it. We always remind everybody that there is nobody better than nobody, but with their piety. Inna Allah la yanduru ila suwarikum wa la ila ajsamikum wa lakin yanduru ila qulubikum wa la a'malikum You know, because nobody created himself, nobody chose to be you know, uh, you know, born in this uh, family or the, in this tribe or this country. Nobody chose his skin color. So we should not be proud of something we did not make, we did not achieve. And we always read for them from Surah Al-Hujurat. And we focus on the Islamic principles and akhlaq how to deal with things. And that's, alhamdulillah, it's going to abolish what, you know, those differences and, and bring everybody together. So that's what we, you know, advocate for. That's what we educate our kids about. And that's why, like, alhamdulillah, the way we approach things, the way we handle things, you know, as you mentioned, like, it's not like, you know, people stop doing it because they're afraid of the consequences in this dunya, but rather to be afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And displeasing Him. Exactly. And, and not everybody maybe feels happy at home. Maybe sometimes the parents are demanding. Maybe they pushing the child to work harder, to study, to do things. And, you know, kids, teenagers, they go to school, they are frustrated, you know, they share things, and they say, you know what, I'm tired of my parents, I want to, you know, have a solution, and maybe some friends, or maybe, you know, teacher, or mainstream schools, or counselors say, you know what, if you don't feel happy, uh, you know, just go and find a place, live uh, somewhere else, you know. A lot of people in the age of 15 or 16, they can move out and they can live with the friends. While in Islamic school, teachers, friends, you know, mainly teachers and counselors, you know, try to educate that child, the frustrated one, how with the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if he is or she is, pay, you know, patient with the parents and the status of the parents, you know, and remind them by reading some, you know, verses from the Quran, right? And on the other hand, the counselor 
would communicate with the parents and educate them how to deal with their child. Mediate between know? the two parties. Exactly, to de-escalate the situation. Zagalakhir, like Brother Nadim, so we kind of spoke in depth uh, from different kind of angles about the Islamic perspective or just kind of the Muslim identity in the child. Uh, can we jump into academics? A lot of parents obviously have uh, a lot of expectation when it comes to their children, academically speaking. Uh, there is a notion, I've heard it personally, that you know Islamic schools are very lacking academically speaking. They might be amazing Islamically uh, from akhlaq perspective. But hey, if your kid goes to Islamic school, maybe good Muslim. Not going to get a job in the future. What do you have to say to that? This notion was disproven over and over again. In elementary schools, in 2019, 16 school, they shared number one and they scored 10 out of 10. And this is based on the result of a standardized testing done by the federal government. It's called EQAO. And we have Fraser Institute, usually they rank schools based on the results of that test. A testimony, you know, by this institution, charitable institution, that does not differentiate between Muslim and non-Muslim or between Islamic schools, public and Catholic, right? So Alhamdulillah, six Islamic schools to get that position, number one, that's a big achievement. If we talk about high schools, Alhamdulillah, the high school that I know, Islamic high schools, in Mississauga and maybe in GTA, almost above 90% of their graduates, they go to the best universities in Ontario. Inshallah, in the second episode that you're going to hear very soon, you will see our students who graduated from our school and they were admitted to all those big universities and esteemed universities such as University of Toronto Downtown, UTM, you know, McMaster, Ryerson, and Waterloo as well. So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, all Islamic schools, they work hard, not only Islamic schools actually, even private schools, because they, we are not funded schools. And therefore, if we don't work hard and we get results, nobody's going to send their kids to our school. Awesome, awesome. Jazakallah khair. Uh, so academics are great. Culture or kind of the, the focus on Islamic morals is great. Uh, in terms of curriculum, is there anything that, uh, you know, Islamic schools here in Canada or in the GTA kind of do extra over the, the Canadian curriculum? Yeah, actually, here in Ontario, all Islamic schools, they do Ontario curriculum, but on the top of that, they teach Arabic, Quran, and Islamic studies. And as I mentioned earlier, like Alhamdulillah, we do our level best to practice, you know, the Islamic way of life by, as I mentioned, making dua in the morning, you know, praying Gidur in congregation, praying Jum'ah, doing some sort of competitions. Jazakallah khair. You mentioned it yourself. Let's talk financials, perhaps the biggest barrier and kind of obstacle for a lot of people enrolling their children uh, in Islamic schools is, is the cost. You know, mainstream public schools are free, covered by the government. Uh, and then Islamic schools, they can start kind of around 3500 a year per student, uh, up to maybe around nine nine thousand. A lot of parents wonder why Islamic school charge fees. And we don't blame them because they don't know that Islamic school, they get nothing from the government. And in order for them to survive, they need the money. They need to pay for teacher. They need to pay for the building. They need to pay for utility. They, they need to pay for, uh, you know, uh, academic, resources. academic resources and stuff like that. And in order for them to do that, they need to charge some fees. And... Alhamdulillah, Islamic schools, they don't ch charge much of the fees. Like they charge between maybe 3500 per academic year to maybe 9500 Depends on the school, on, you know, how much they pay salaries, uh, the building, the, and so forth. But on the other hand, if you look at the mainstream schools where they are free, they don't charge students. But guess what? Do you know how much was the budget for mainstream schools in Ontario? It was about 31 billion. Oh, subhanAllah. And not to mention extra other like money that given for busing, for, you know, uh, utilities and so forth. And not to mention 
that mainstream school, they don't pay for rent, they don't pay for the building, because everything is covered by the government. And if you can look, you know, at, at the report or how much each student costing the mainstream schools, it's, it averages about like $15,000 per student, per student per year. SubhanAllah. So although the, the parents are not paying, they're paying somehow through taxes because that's yes. how much each school bills the government. Exactly, exactly. And if we take another, you know, comparison with other non-Islamic private schools, they start with like 14,000 per year and they might reach up to like 40, 50,000. So technically Islamic school, they are charging pennies compared to other schools. And you mentioned like from an academic Islamic perspective, they're providing quality and value that is just as good, if not even better. That's exactly right. And the reason for that, you know, because, you know, teachers in Islamic schools, they, you know, they are, they have a passion. They, they don't work because of the money. Because it Islamic doesn't make school, sense. Yeah. yeah, because Islamic school, they cannot afford to pay them the way other teachers. Competitive ways. Competitive, yeah. exactly, in public system. But those teachers, if they don't have a great goal, which is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which, you know, to make a difference in, in, you know, the personalities, the life of the children they are teaching, it's not worth it, honestly. You know, the money they're getting for spending effort, much hours, exerting, yeah. you know, to teach and to go home and to mark, you know, papers and, you know, it's not worth it. Without the ikhlas and the dedication, you know. It only becomes worth it with that kind of component of, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's exactly. And I always, when I hire a teacher, I say, you know what, it doesn't matter how much I pay you. If I can pay you maybe $1,000 an hour, you deserve more. You know, unfortunately, we cannot do that because, you know, we have limited resources. We cannot, on the other hand, increase the tuition fees on parents because a lot of Muslim parents, they have two, three, four children. Imagine if we're going to ask like non-Islamic schools or maybe the public school, $1,500 per child. If you have four children, it's $6,000. And if your salary, even $10,000 after tax deduction, you know, you're going to end up with like almost 7,000. So how are you going to pay 6,000? How you, what the, uh, the extra 1,000 is going to help you? So honestly, like, you know, most of Islamic schools working and doing it for the Akhir, not for this dunya. It's not, it's not a money-making machine. Exactly, exactly. And then just from the numbers you've shared, whether it's a non-for-profit or a money-making machine, education is not cheap. Just kind of the numbers you shared about uh, mainstream public schools here in the GTA or, or Ontario. Yes. On average, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars per student. Yes. Even if you're not paying that, that tells you that's how much it's costing someone else. That's Education true. is not cheap. We know that. It's like Allah, here, brother Nadim. Uh, we've spoken uh, in depth uh, from different perspectives. Uh, I feel like a lot, uh, a lot more people have a clearer understanding of of this kind of discourse or this uh, conversation. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that people benefited and now uh, are more empowered to kind of make the, the correct decision. Jazakallah khair. Uh, any closing remarks, conclusions, you know, one thing that you want the parents to take away from this? My dear parents, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I was able to give justice to such an important topic. But please, my dear parents, remember one thing that your kids are amana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask all of us about the amana that he gave us. And remember the ayah in Surah Al-Tahreem, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduha al-nas wal hijara. My dear parents, your kids are vulnerable and they don't know better. So you need to invest in their deen, to invest in their akhlaq, because they're going to be your passport to heaven they're gonna be there to take you to hold your hand to bring you to heaven with them otherwise if we fail to guide our kids the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to guide them 
then will be accountable because they don't know better. They don't know where to go. They don't know whether or not, you know, putting them in, in the wrong environment is going to harm them. So remember, you have responsibility. Every human being has responsibility. The father, the mother, as Prophet Sallallahu said, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ جَزَاكُمُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this is your host, Brother Allah, at your service, and it's nice to be back. Interesting, slightly, because when I came to Mecca and Medina, it was uh, seriously cold, <laughs> and I was not very happy. However, I'm very happy to be home. It's nice to be there. I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to bless you, bless your family, health, and wealth, and continuing with the art of parenting. This is a journey that I had to take and I want to share it with you. So please join me on this journey, my journey to Mecca. And I'm going to touch up on the lessons learned of the Isra and Mi'raj. I'm going to go into details, just the pointers. And I understand Dr. Amjad Habibullah already talked about it, but I will take you on with me. So please, welcome aboard. And here we go. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Wallahi, I wish this for everyone. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you like to grant you an invitation if you haven't been there. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you like to accept from you if you have been there. But never deprive you to visit again and again and again. Because of the hadith, Allah expiates your sins, absolves your sins. So it's a beautiful feeling because you're a guest of Ar-Rahman. Allah gives you an invitation. Literally, only those who are invited are allowed to go. Subhanallah. Wallahi, I know so many brothers and sisters. They're rich, they had the time, they had the health, the wealth, everything, but they were not able to go. And some people, Wallahi, I remember some brothers came to me crying, Sheikh, I want to do this so much, but I don't have the money. I said, Sheikh, Wallahi, Allah promised, if you're sincere in the intention, Allah will grant you the invitation. If you want to perform hajj, if you want to pay off your debts, if you want to get married and all of that stuff, Allah will promise to help you. So may Allah give us sincerity to be able to visit over and over and over again and use us uh, me. Never dear places. So when we first went to Medina, this is my first Umrah that I've been with for a long time. This is like one week in Mecca, one week in Medina. This was absolutely beautiful. Otherwise, you know, you're like four nights there, four nights here, two days of travel, and that's it. You're done. But this one, well, mashallah, was long. So it felt really good. Interesting, though, because it was unique in a way because Mecca was always thriving. But I've never seen it in a way that you had to have all these discipline, checks and boundaries, and you have to prove this, show your apps, show your permission. It, was, it, felt, it felt a little bit different. Let's put it this way. Medina was 20% were all, almost open. That's it. The rest of them were closed. It, it felt, uh, I don't want to say the word abandoned because Medina is never abandoned, but it felt interesting, like uniquely different. Uh, you know, in the presence, subhanAllah, uh, of the, the best lands in, in, in the world, you have to also keep that in mind where you put your footsteps and move it on. But the unique the, uh, steps that we've taken, I always stick with the group. I says, remember when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had to take the journey and who was his company. And remember where he left, remember where he came and how he changed the whole ummah and the birthplace of uh, uh, Medina, the birthplace of Islam, and the 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 the, the Hira, how the cave, how Jabal al Nur, how it started, how he left everyone, abandoned everyone, his own family, his own uh, clan, his own friends, just rebelling because he did not accept the fact that these people used to worship, uh, you know, statues. And he did not accept the fact. He left it behind. So the lessons learned, brothers and sisters, is what do we leave behind for the sake of Allah? Even family members, I'm not asking you to abandon anyone. I'm just saying, how much are we willing to sacrifice? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses you to be a key to open the gates of goodness and close the gates of evil, congratulations. Bro. So we should be asking Allah to use us, not replace us. For his ta'ah, in his obedience, not the other way around. So we could be leaders in good, not the other way around. But look when he had as a company. 
Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And since we're talking about Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he was also the one that believed in him and he was given the title Abu Bakr Siddiq because in the Isra and Mi'raj, I understand that the scholars differed upon when it is and I'm not going to go there because everybody has their own opinion when it was uh, you know and all of that that's not what I'm after I'm after the lessons learned and for that Abu Bakr Siddiq when he heard about it even some of the Muslims actually came out of the fold of Islam because they couldn't believe Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a matter of fact, uh, some of the, 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 the people of Quraysh, they always said, don't listen to Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa But when he said that, I have been to the Masjid al-Aqsa, <laughs> they said, come, listen to what he's saying. It's the exact opposite. But when he was told, your friend is saying things, he says, did he say it? He said, yes. He says, in qala qad qalaha faqad sabah. <laughs> if he said it, he's he he's telling the truth, and that's why he was called Wa Abu Bakr as Siddiq. You are that one who is that known of that to be the truthful one. Subhanallah, the believing one, and that's an honor that nobody else will have in the open. Amazing, Wallahi. And when you think about Jabal Thur, you know the the Ghar Thur, and it's mentioned the Thur because it, it looks like the the hub of the the bull. Right, and that's uh, I know that there's obvious opinions, uh, other opinions, but that's the, the stronger opinion. And how difficult it was to go up and go in the back and to hide and the strategic move that he went to the opposite and so on for the journey. And how again Abu Bakr Siddiq Radilan was there, and when he went to, to the Ghar Thawr, how he took his izar, the one that he covers with uh, his uh, upper body, with he shoved in. There were three holes in the cave. He shoved one in. And he had two others. He put one to the right foot, one to the left foot to cover to make sure nothing will harm Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even when he was actually stung by a scorpion, he was steering. And that's, he did not wake Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm, no, I'm sure we know the, the, the story, but it's just reminding ourselves, reminding our children, sharing these beautiful stories with them. He says, I don't want to harm Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the same man that when he was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was persecuted with the intestines of a camel thrown in. He was the one that defended him. Nobody else was there. and he, His face was swollen so much. It was like one layer. They could not recognize his features. When he woke up from that, when he was unconscious, did he say, call 911? You know, mommy? He, I said, what happened to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Amazing shit. Allah, what an amazing company. He was. But when Prophet Muhammad sallam, was talking to him, he says, La tahzan, inna Allah ma'ana. Don't be sad, don't be sorry. Inna Allah, see, first he said, Allah ma'ana. Ma'iyya comes after. The, the one that the company is us. But Allah comes first because he's talking to a believer. But when Musa alayhi salam, was talking to the Jews, he said, Inna ma'iyya rabbi sayyadeen. First ma'iyya, here. I'm here. You can see me, tangible. You can touch me. But he said, Rabbi, my Lord, is with me. SubhanAllah. Different because they did not have the strength of Iman, of belief and faith and creed like Abu Bakr Siddiq. Imagine on the way to Medina. You know when we go from Mecca to Medina, either the bus or the train or whatever it is, it's difficult. Especially in Hajj. They had to go on a, a back of a camel persecuted people, the, 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 the head hunters were after them. Do you imagine that? And they took different routes. That means longer. So we don't have to complain about anything, brothers and sisters. So when we talk about uh, going to Medina and how he started to go inside and the first thing he did was to build a masjid and, and you, know, uh, you know, think about the masjid in Medina and the uh, story behind it. Subhanallah. The, the Sahaba, Allah how the, they coupled one another to the brotherhood, how strong it was, the sacrifice they gave. They gave everything, half of what they have to their brethren that came from Mecca. How much we sacrifice? How much do we invest? How much we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ta ta how much do we follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How do we want to help our brothers and sisters in the ummah? How much do we at least make dua for them? Not nafsi, nafsi. I'm okay, my family is okay, I have roof over my head, clothes on my back, food on the table, khalas. I'm okay. La wallahi. We have to always keep our brothers and sisters, those who are less fortunate than us, all the time. And you think about it again. When he went back, when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu went back victorious, he should have slaughtered those who ousted them, 
taking their land, their wealth, taking their family away, taking their, their homes away, taking everything away, businesses. What did he say? What do you think I will do today? He says, Akhun Kareem, a generous man, a son of a generous man. So, Allah, he will not say, Abdul Salih Fulan, let the three Malik Muliyahum, if he will end to I will not give you any hard time or difficulties. I will not remind you of all that difficulties that you've given me hard time, but you are go, you're free. SubhanAllah. Ajeeb. Lessons learned. We'll finish with this, inshallah. The lessons learned. First of all, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi. Glory be to the one that he gave the night journey and the ascension. Abdihi. First of all, the subhan, when you say subhan, khalas, you don't think about how could it be what it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. Everything is capable of all, all of that. So you tell him, you submit. Then you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miracles of that. And then he says, Abdihi. So we're honored to be called Abdullah, the servant, the slaves, and worshippers of Allah. If you call the best of creation, Abd, yes, we should be honored. We should be slave to Allah, not our whims and desires, not to shaitan, not to the dollars and cents, not to our spouses, not to our children, not to our bosses, only to Allah. You're free from anything else. You can also understand the status of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq when he had that honor. You think about that all the prophets and messengers were led by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Al-Aqsa. You think about it, that means he is the leader of all the prophets and messengers. And all the prophets and messengers came with Tawheed, one message, monotheism. And Islam is the innate, deen al-fitrah. It's a primal instinct, the innate, the natural way you should be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa jalla wa And the hadith that says that لا يؤمن رجل في سلطانه that no one should be led in his own home. When Prophet Muhammad sallam, led the prophets and messengers in Al-Aqsa, which means he is the owner of that house. Everybody else follows. That means that house belongs to us. So don't listen to all the fabricated stories or the Bollywood theory and everything else that comes in between, all the politics and everything else that you hear. And you also have to understand the status of the Salah. And that's what I will leave you with today, inshallah. When Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ula had honored Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know he's the leader of prophets and messengers. He invited him. Otherwise, he would send Jibreel down to all the prophets and messengers if they wanted to relay a message on. But Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was honored. This is something important. You know, when like uh, your boss, something important, he would invite you up to the, uh, his office. But if it's something minor, you would go on down before and say, you know what, uh, Whoever so and so do this, don't do that. That's it, simple. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Jibreel was his companion, and he was given the honor, and he saw the Prophet's message up and so on, so many things. Sidrat al Muntaha. There are places that no one else approaches. An honor over an honor over an honor. The status of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the only act of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Muslims from the heavens, not the earth. Is the salah. So you have to ask yourself, how is my salah? How is my that wetted, amad, you know, the pillar of Islam? Anything else other than the salah will be accepted or not accepted according to the salah. Ajeeb. Wallahi. Think about it, brothers and sisters. Think about the importance. Think about the generosity and the mercy of Allah. We're supposed to pay, pray 50, and now we pray 5. And we get 50 for the reward. So imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, if this was the measuring stick, whether you make it or break it, go to heaven or hell, is your salah, how could you let it go? Imagine you somebody has an inside information in the stock market. And he's telling you, I'm going to give you a call when it's time to buy. You're going to make lots of money. And now do you think you're going to want to miss this phone call? Well, I want you to think about the stock market and the person who's going to call you is the mu'adha. The call is the call of the prayer. The stock is your salah. Your reward is jannah. With that, I ask Allah subhanahu wa jalla 
to reward you, Jannah. The highest level of firdaus with no accountability in walk in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the journey of life, being the best parents they are. In the art of parenting, we'll continue next week, inshallah. I won't forget you, my dua. Don't forget me, dua. Zakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, back again with another session with Muslim Do. Alhamdulillah, two weeks before Ramadan, today is Monday, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every one of you and to allow us to be together in Jannah. And the dua that is needed most nowadays is Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, give us a chance to live another Ramadan. <laughs> inshallah, with this halaqa today, inshallah, I'm just focusing in one part, which is heart, which is to clear our hearts from any negative feelings towards others and towards people. And it is very important for every one of us is to continue to have a heart that is pure, nothing that you carry in your heart. Even if we have some issues within our family members, within our friends, within our uh, partners or uh, co-workers, is to always forget and forgive. For the sake of Allah, for the sake of getting the reward of people who will be in Jannah, bi ta'ala. Ahibbat al-Akarim, one of the great brothers who actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him, he said that he cannot sleep at night except that his heart and he will struggle to make sure that his heart is actually clean of any uh, hatred or any uh, uh, jealousy or envy or any problem towards any other Muslim. He would make sure that he sleeps when he sleeps, that his heart is completely off uh, 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 away completely away from any uh, uh, negative feelings towards other people uh, from all Muslims around and that is very important for everyone and he said that is uh, the, the uh, medication for that for himself he said that he whenever he feels very uh, uh, his heart is negative about somebody what he does he will make wudu and he will go into salah and he will make dua for himself and for the people that he he may encounter a problem with them. So he will actually do this great work, make the wudu, pray to raka, and make dua for himself that Allah clear his heart. And in the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless, to bless the people who, who, who may feel, who may, he may feel say anything negative about them. So this is what he used to do. And that's how he will keep himself strong and healthy and have a healthy heart. May Allah give us all healthy heart. We need this in uh, nowadays, especially with the challenges that we see every day, the problem and the finance problem that we see around the world and around our families. We need always to clean up our hearts and make ourselves ready uh, so that when we die or when we sleep, because you know the sleeping is a death, is, is a small death, and the actual death is also something that could happen anytime. So when we die, we need to make sure that our heart are clean and pure and we don't have any negativities inside our hearts towards anyone bismillah let's take the story the beautiful story of one of the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he has praised that person and nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said about that person in three different occasions he said to the companion sitting with him a man from jannah will enter now he said it once, and in the next day he said it again, and then the same person came in. And third time, Nabi Sallallahu said, a man from Jannah will enter, and it was the same person again. From the Sahaba who wanted to know what this person is actually doing, and they wanted to imitate his, uh, his actions. So they wanted to know what this person is actually doing different than anyone, that to the point that the Prophet Sallallahu named him in Jannah, named that person to be in Jannah. What kind of things that he does every night? Maybe he stays up the whole night praying or he makes dua or dhikr the whole time. Uh, so uh, from the Sahaba who wanted to know, so it was uh, Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala an. Abdullah bin Amr, he followed that uh, Sahabi to his house and he wanted to be his guest for three days because in his three days time he will know 
what kind of work this person, this individual is doing so that he can do it and he can be included to be in Jannah as well. So he went to that Sahabi, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ, and he wanted to see. So when he went with him, he didn't see much that the person is doing. He sleeps after Isha. He doesn't wake up for Qiyam. Uh, he's normal. He will wake up for Fajr. Uh, maybe he, he will pray just normal couple rakats before prayers. And that person is is not that uh, fasting every day. He doesn't give sadaqat every day. He's actually miskeen. He doesn't have much that he gives other than what is being, uh, uh, that other people give actually more than him. So uh, in the end, Abdullah didn't see changes, didn't see something that is really extra, really super that he could take from that sahabi and he can do it. So what he did, Sayyidina Abdullah, Ibn Amr, he asked him, he said, Yani, please, Yani, tell me why you were granted that privilege to be in Jannah. And the Nabi Sallallahu named you three times that you will be in Jannah. For what, Yani? What is the, the, uh, the, the work that you do, the actions, the deeds that you are actually proceeded to Jannah before everyone to the point that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that you are in Jannah and it was you three times coming in. Uh, so tell me, so uh, the, the, the Sahabi, he answered Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu and he said, you know what, not much that I do, not that uh, big work that I do or uh, kind of great actions, except that when I sleep at night, I sleep and I have completely forgiven anyone and I have completely uh, uh, removed from my heart any negative feelings towards anybody. No jealousy, no envy, no uh, bad feelings even from any individual around the world that, or if from among the society that he lives in, I have forgiven everybody and I made, made my heart uh, uh, completely pure of any negativity towards other people. So Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he asked him, is it all what you do? You have proceeded and you became in Jannah. And the Nabi Sallallahu counted you three times in Jannah because of this one. Subhanallah, this is something that is, you know, it's, uh, it seems easy for, for, for us. That is, you know, it's, yeah, okay, let me, no, it's actually is not easy and is not really, uh, something that everybody can do. It is really hard work to forgive everyone, to remove anything from your heart towards others who hurted you, who oppressed you, who did wrong to you. It is not easy job. That's why the pe person who will do that, he's in Jannah, inshallah. And we need really to do that. Especially, you know what? Recently we have, we have had the middle night of Shaban. And in that night, Allah will forgive for everyone except to, for two individuals. The mushrik, the one who commits shirk, and the one who carries negativities in his heart towards other people. May Allah forgive our short and our mistakes, you know, it is not easy. All of us have that feeling uh, sometimes towards others that we, you know what, and we are not happy with them. You know, uh, uh, for friends and for close relatives, clo close family members, we should not carry negativities and uh, carry hard feelings towards others. We should forgive, we should reconcile, and you know, leave it. Dunya doesn't worse, really. Dunya doesn't uh, need us because it's dunya, you know, it's short time, short term, and we will return to Allah. So it's better that we forgive and ask Allah to make our hearts pure and we don't really uh, carry too much into uh, our hearts. We need to be uh, open and remove that f bad feelings towards others. Just leave it to Allah. The only thing that you do it, you do it because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that might lead us to take another hadith and that other hadith and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said as narrated by Abu Hurairah Rasulullah said لا يحل لمسلم أن يهجر أخاه فوق ثلاث It is not uh, allowed for a Muslim It is not allowed, it is not permissible for a Muslim to cut his brother, his sister to cut his family ties, his friends to cut with them, not to uh, not to be good with them for over three days or three nights It is not allowed for a Muslim, uh, and if it happens, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, nar. The one who disconnect or cut his ties, his friendship or his brothers uh, that he knows very well, and they have rights upon him, he cut them for over three days or nights, he will enter hellfire. So we have to be very, very careful. Actually, we have to be extra careful when we deal with people so that we can be in Jannah. We need to forgive one another for the sake of Allah. And I see this common 
It is actually well, very common among families, among friends, among the uh, some circles. We we need to remove that, especially among the household or families together. We need not to indulge into some actions that will lead us to cut ourselves well, it's very dangerous because the end of it is hellfire and if we remove it then the end of it is Jannah inshallah and we all want to be in Jannah may Allah grant us all and uh, Jannah Allahumma Ameen one of the great things to do is increase dua that Allah make your heart clean uh, always uh, mention dhikrullahi ta'ala stay away of bad deeds uh, uh, do lots of multiple good actions and good deeds. Uh, increase your hasanat over your sayat. Say salam to everyone and ask about people. Give gifts, give hadiyah. Uh, always uh, try to seek the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. Forgive and uh, ignore bad things from others and just keep your heart clean and safe. And also give sadaqah and be from amongst the muhsineen who always do good righteous deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and make our hearts clean and pure. Barakallahu feekum and we'll see you again in another time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Brothers and sisters, once again, I'm back. Uh, I know we've been covering this, um, you know, last few topics. Um, just because we're, we're taking our time with this, this, this um, topic um, and the reason we're taking our time because this is a very important topic because all other topics um, that we continue to talk moving forward would be somewhat contingent or dependent on this. Um, so when we did the, the beginning parts, we covered all the basic stuff, how to give dawah. I think more than enough is for average person to go out and start speaking to people about Islam. However, some people that may want to take their understanding a little bit deeper is why we're 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 discussing discussing this stuff. So what what we've been discussing is the uh, fitra and the first principles. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Usman. I am an outreach specialist for Ira uh, in Canada. So today I will be discussing a little bit about what is dawah. So before we begin, we start with the name of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, which is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And assalamu alaikum, may peace and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may appear be upon all of you. So today's topic, we're discussing what is dawah. So I'm sure many of you um, have been actively or, uh, you know, passively or actively been involved with the dawah. So we as Muslims globally are, are you know, wherever we are, uh, we love our deen. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so when we love something, we want to share it. So globally, I mean, oh, there's a time and a place I used to think that maybe people don't give as much dawah. But subhanAllah, as time's been going on, I'm starting to realize that there are so many people out there. They are conveying the message of Islam with compassion and reason that we sometimes don't know about. So, um, you know, there are people just to give you some example. There is one brother in the Vaughan area which nobody's probably even heard of. Um, he goes out locally and takes some flyers from us and he goes door to door to deliver these, these flyers uh, to people's home. Again, he doesn't work for any organization. He does it privately. We have another brother in Mississauga that, uh, you know, is on own, his own time, takes people out to restaurants and sits people down and, and you know, explains the, the message of Islam. So there is a lot of khair that happens in the Muslim community. Now, for some of the people that may or may not be aware of what dawah is, uh, this is for those brothers, what is dawah? So, linguistically, when we use the word dawah in, in, in the Arabic language, okay, the Arabic language, the word comes so dal, wa, ain, wow, which basically means is what is to invite. So, what are we saying here? So, you know, many of you may or may not know in the Indian Pakistani uh, community, when we call someone um, for uh, to your house for dinner, we usually say in, in the, in the Indo-Pakistan Bangladesh community is to we're calling someone over for Dawat. So what we're saying here is when we call someone over for Dawat, usually the way we call people with Dawat is how do we call them? I'm sure many of you know. Then when we call people for dawat, we usually call them with love. We say, hey, brother or sister or uncle or auntie, uh, please come over to our house. Uh, we are going to be having some dinner over. 
uh, you know, at our place on the weekend, uh, would you please join us? So as you can see, when we call someone over for dinner, we do it with, with lots of love and, and, you know, respect. Now, this is we're inviting someone just for food. So imagine we're inviting them over to our house. So when we're inviting someone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what kind of, you know, ethics we should have, what, should, what kind of, uh, you, know, you know, love or compassion or humility, uh, what, what should we have? I think it should be way beyond uh, what we usually do when we're calling people over for dinner. So why am I saying this, brothers and sisters that are watching this? Because unfortunately, globally, uh, we have been taught somehow or we've, we have made an, you know, a perception that you know, we've been watching some great duats globally. They've been doing some phenomenal works like, you know, uh, you know don't need to give you names. Uh, but just to say, you know, uh, uh, you know, many or, you know, there's so many duats globally, uh, Sheikh Abdurrahim Green and so on and so forth. And then we watch all those people in Hyde Park. And what we've come to realize is when we watch these people, you know, uh, we see them always in a debate mode or is it a discussion mode. So because we see them doing this, we sometimes, somehow the Muslim community has uh, thought that this is dawah. So this is what they think, how we call people to Islam by arguing with people and debating with them and sometimes belittling people. And, and telling them how, you know, uh, yes, Islam is obviously superior than any other tradition. Uh, we're, not, we're not shying away from that part. But that being said, you know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to call people with, with, you know, with, with wisdom, you know, and with good preaching, you know. So the idea is for us to really, you know, change the narrative of da'wah. So this is what we're working with globally is to change the narrative is not always to have jadal, not always to have arguments. It's always to use wisdom when we're calling people and in wisdom in many different ways. Sometimes we call people, you know, take them off for dinner, for example, uh, or we'll invite them over to your house or maybe take people off for a coffee. Yes, there is an element of when we go out and speak to people on the street. And I'm not saying that you know, we're against the, the, the jadal, the, you know, the arguments. We're not, we're not saying that, but what we're saying is that not really dawah and there is a place for it. Uh, it should be done with certain people that are qualified to do that. Um, but I don't think an average Muslim should be doing dawah in this, this manner. And this is one of the things that I wanted to kind of always, uh, we have this four part series that we'll be discussing and in this fourth part series, before we can discuss anything else, I wanted to discuss this part with the Muslim community is to when you're calling people, how do we call people, right? And the reason why we need to call people, right? It's so important, brothers and sisters, if you can just understand this, as you can see that what is going on globally, we have so much Islamophobia that's going on. I'm sure many of you know we're in Canada here. Even in Canada, recently we had the London thing happen. Then we had the uh, thing in uh, Hamilton with, with someone's uh, wife and daughter was attacked, uh, a very prominent Muslim in the community. Um, then we had, you know, Etobicoke and, you know, in the Scarborough area. So we are seeing this, this trend has, has become that, uh, you know, that they have misunderstandings of Islam. So the challenge, what we're saying, brothers and sisters, is that, we know that there's a need. We definitely need to discuss uh, what Islam is and clear up some misconceptions. But the challenge is that, you know, we uh, somehow get into these debates and arguments. And that's what we want to take people away and to say, yes, we, there is a need. We need to share our message. And obviously, you know, I always say to people, uh, this is my one of my pet lines I always talk about when I'm talking about da'wah is, if you're not telling your story, then someone else is. So if you're not speaking up, then someone else is speaking behalf of you. So as you know, there are many uh, speakers that are either non-Muslim or they may have no, not enough knowledge of Islam. Maybe they're not uh, learned in the Islamic academics um, that go out and speak on behalf of us. And sometimes they actually cause more harm, even though sometimes we as Muslims take their information they say oh look you know this guy is speaking about islam he must be a really good guy and i'm not saying 
they have malicious uh, thoughts. I'm just saying is as Muslims that we need to be, you know, speaking about Islam first ourselves. But in order to speak about Islam, we need to understand Islam. And in order to understand Islam, we need to study a little bit. So this is one of the things. It's a bit of a circular thing that, you know, if you're not studying the tradition, you don't know the fundamentals. Uh, you don't know what Tawheed is. You know what Rububiyya, Uluhiyya is, what the, you know, worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his creative power and his, you know, uh, you know, his, it, that he deserves to be worshipped, you know, his Uluhiyya. Um, so these things we need to understand what is worship in Islam. So for us Muslims, you know, how can we discuss about Islam if we haven't really dabbled into some of these things? To people is that you know get involved with the Muslim community, look at your local masajids, see if they have some you know academic classes. If not, reach out to us. Uh, we can connect you with some shaykhs that are doing classes locally and internationally. If we we can connect you with others. Uh, do some signposting. So it's very important that we as Muslims give the right message of Islam. As you know, uh, these are some of the things that are happening uh, in, in the world, uh, which are causing biz, big challenges for the Muslims. And we want to change that perception. We want to show people that not only Islam is a religion of peace, Islam is a religion of justice. And from justice, we will get peace. So, you know, this is one of the things we need to really understand, you know, why the dawah is very, very important. And why there's a need for dawah. <clears throat> so, and brothers and sisters, just for all of us to kind of understand, when we look at the Quran, when we look at the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do we see in that book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tell us about the Anbiya? We, he doesn't tell us what the Anbiya is doing. He does not tell, you know, uh, Salah, uh, Saleh, or, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Prophet Zakaria. Uh, may peace be a blessing upon all of them or, or you know, Dawud alayhi salam or Yunus alayhi salam. We don't see how many rakahs they prayed, how many salah they did, how many times they fasted, what time did they get up for sahur, uh, you know, what time did they open their fast. We don't find that in the Quran. We don't find the details. But what we do find in the Quran is them calling people to la ilaha illallah. This is what we see, calling them to worship. There's only one deity and it deserves to be praised and worship. And that's what we see over and over and over. So we as Muslims, if we're not calling to this message, this call, this, this call of, you know, of the Rasul Pak Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Risala of Allah is to convey the message of Islam, then we're not really doing justice. We're not really connecting with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained to us that what these great anbiya were doing was calling people to la ilaha illallah. And that's what we need to do is to share the message of Islam with compassion, with reason, and with, with wisdom. So this is very, very important, brothers and sisters. Um, if you are inquisitive, how do you get involved? that uh, alhamdulillah.org has oh, sorry go take a free course Sheikh Abdurrahim Green has delivered a uh, a free course on dawah uh, it's absolutely free there's no charges you can go and take that and uh, you know this is something that's you know helpful to all of us I really believe that Muslims should be walking talking uh, da'is uh, so this is very, very important for all of us to, to know. So before we, uh, you know, continue on and about today's topic, I just want to ask the community here. Uh, here's a picture of a kitchen that is very messy after a meal was cooked. So when we look at this picture, what do we see? We see a messy kitchen. So when we see this messy kitchen, what do we do when we have a messy kitchen, brothers and sisters? I'm sure you know all the answer. We clean it up. We clean it up. So now the question is, if we have a messy kitchen the next day, what do we do? After we cooked, we clean it up again. And the third day and the fourth day and so on and so forth. So what this picture is representing and what I'm trying to do is that we sometimes feel that, hey, you know, I spoke to someone about Islam once in like 2007. I'm done, you know, or someone says, you know what? Uh, you know, the brothers in, in the Dawah, they called me and, you know, one day I went and I gave Dawah in downtown Toronto and that's it. I'm done. I've done my part. Now, just the same way that, you know, when we look at our kitchen and it gets messy every day, we, we, we need to clean it up in the same way the Dawah needs to keep going. 
ongoing, constant thing. This idea that we just go out and give dawah once in our life and that we've done our, you know, the hujjah is lifted off of us. We don't have to do any more. This is, this is incorrect understanding. So we definitely <clears throat> need to continue the effort of dawah. We need to continue calling people to la ilaha illallah. Now we understand some of the things that we covered, why the dawah is, you know, what is the root word? What does the, the means is to invite uh, in the Arabic language, right? Is to invite people. And what do we want to invite them to we want them to enjoin good and forbid evil? And what do we enjoin in good? The Mufassirin say here, the, the good here is the whole calling them to Islam, right? And we're forbidding, which is evil, right? So these are some of the things that I wanted to kind of discuss with you guys today. Um, uh, I don't know if we have much time. Uh, I have, may have a couple more minutes, about two, three minutes. So inshallah, I just cover one more slide here. One of the things I wanted to discuss with people that sometimes people feel that, you know, who's really responsible for giving dawah? So I know in academically, uh, you know, it's, it's, which is means that if someone in the community is giving dawah, then the hujja is lifted off the community. Just like, you know, if someone dies, it's, you know, it's an obligation for the Muslim, Muslim community to bury some, the Muslim brother or sister. But if no one in the community is not, you know, uh, doing that, then the whole ummah or the whole community could be sinning. In the same way, the scholars say that it's for the kifaya. Now, if we say it's for the kifaya, that means that if it's for the kifaya, does that mean that, okay, if one brother uh, Abdullah or brother Ali or, you know, so and so, or, you know, Sheikh Amjad is going out and giving dawah, is that the hujjahs lifted off the whole ummah? Come on, think about it. We have 32 million people in Canada. So if a handful of people are giving dawah, that's the responsibility is there. There's so many people need to be giving dawah for enough people. This is very important for the Muslim community to get involved with dawah in every effort. Um, and not only that, that, you know, as some of the scholars said, there could also be an individual responsibility. It means that every Muslim at some level should be going out there and conveying the message of Islam with the community and sharing the message. We all have a role to play. Now, if you are think that you don't have the knowledge, alhamdulillah, as the Prophet ﷺ said, convey for me even one ayah. So first of all, this I want to debunk this, that you know we all have to become scholars. We all have to become like uh, you know Sheikh Amjad here, and then that's the only time we can give da'wah. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. The Prophet ﷺ is saying is, convey for me even one ayah. So what does that mean? brothers and sisters, is to convey anything that you know, even if it's a little bit. So like if you know only one ayah, let's say you know, Kullu wallah wahad, you know what it is. It means God say, if you know that you understand it and you implement it in your life, then the scholars say that you should convey for even one ayah means you understand that God is one. There are so many people out there that are, uh, you know, they may not be doing that. So like you see the picture on the right here where the brother is, is smoking. If you see someone smoking in your family member, you have to tell the person, hey, smoking is not allowed. It's not good for you. It's not healthy. So in the same way, when we see people that are doing what? When you're not worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not, you know, following the deen of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing shirk, right? And it's one of the gravest sins in Islam. So what we want to do is we want to take people away from doing shirk and we want to get them, they are doing the misdirected worship and get them to worship their creator. This is the purpose of today. We wanted to discuss all of us have a role to play uh, to calling people to la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah collectively and individually uh, as a Muslim community. Uh, so we sh all should take the opportunity and get involved with Dawah at any level, whether it's with AIRA, whether it's with any other organization. MashaAllah, there's so many are amazing Muslim organizations that are taking up this responsibility and taking uh, moving forward. So, you know, brothers and sisters, for these, you know, these, uh, these uh, Dawah activities that are happening or trainings, and I think you cannot be part of it because 
for whatever reason you feel that you know maybe speaking to people is not your strength then there's many other parts you could play when it comes to dawa you can do admin work you could do marketing you could do social media you can do networking there are so many things that the dawa needs you know when we see the non muslims when we see the batil conveying the message when we see the the christian missionaries they spend billions and billions of dollars on on their batil dawa on you know uh, to a point i've seen them actually some of the the christian missionaries learn different languages to go convey the message these put they put their money where their mouth is they actually invest into it so you know you can invest in the dawa you can support other dais you can support the dawa you can make dua for people if you don't have money of so get involved with the dawa convey the message and for all of us uh to be active and you know and islam gives you that sakina that gives you that tranquility and it gives you that that you know that strength from inner strength when you connect with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you connect with his message and you're sharing the message i know i've went over a few more minutes here than i should have i apologize uh but i'll stop here inshallah and we'll pick it up next monday and we'll be discussing the next topic so jazakallah khair assalamu alaikum everyone and inshallah speak to you also bismillah wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa man wala welcome to our another episode of paradigm shift in muslim do i uh, thank you for joining us so to begin today we're talking still about having a paradigm shift in the way we look at the deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Um, and the sad reality is, is that many of us see that the deen is within the four walls of the masjid, or while we are in prayer, or while in the month of Ramadan. And we see this so often. And the reason I'm bringing this topic is the month of Ramadan is right around the corner. Um, we see so many of us, and it, I'm not saying that it's bad, but it's a paradigm shift that we have to have as Muslims. We say, oh, during the month of Ramadan, I'm no longer going to listen to music, or I'm no longer going to do what I think is haram, X, Y, or Z, whatever you believe to be haram, as if the God of Ramadan is different than the God of Shaban, different than the God of Shawwal, different than the God of Rajab. Um, and the paradigm shift that we have to have as believers is to first and foremost to realize as Muslims that Islam is far beyond just the ibadat that we have. Islam is all encompassing it's a holistic religion from every aspect from every avenue and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives us an example but before he gives us an example he tells the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explaining to him and explaining to the rest of us how all encompassing this religion is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qul ba'da a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alamin Say, O oh Muhammad, indeed my prayer, my rites of sacrifice, my living and my dying are all for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So it, it encompasses, yes, salah and siyam and all our, acts, all our rituals of, of, of Islam, but it also very much encompasses our daily life. We are rewarded, and this, we see this in the Sirah of the Prophet ﷺ, you are rewarded for feeding your family. You are rewarded for doing the things that we do naturally day in and day out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the best of examples. He gives us the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرَجُّ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخَرُ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهُ كَثِيرًا Right? The truly, indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have been given a good example to follow for him who hopes in Allah in the last day and remembers Allah. So we see in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, The seerah of the Prophet is all is just to make it sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example for every scenario. The life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encompasses almost every scenario. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shows us how to be rich, shows us how to be poor, shows us how what happens in the time of war, what happens in the time of peace, how to give da'wah. Even in the things that we don't even consider or expect, the sahaba would go and ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's how we have the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is even teaching the Sahaba how to eat. He's telling them, a third, for your st- a third for food, a third for water, and a third for breathing. How did the hadith come to place? By the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeing some Sahaba eat and commenting on the way they eat. Teaching us how to sleep, sleeping on our right hand side. Even teaching us how to go to the bathroom. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has dictated even how we go to the bathroom. And this is why the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all encompassing. And one thing I want to comment on is so often we see the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as 
as something that, that just see it in the masjid and leave it there. But what we should realize is that if we live with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every aspect, we begin to see the responses and the, 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 the proofs and evidences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in every facet. In the facet of fear. And this is Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, who is the, grand, the great-grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He's actually talking about depression, talking about depression. And he says, He's talking about depression. And the reason I highlighted this in particular, this story in particular of Jafar al-Sadiq, is that so often we think that, oh, Islam was way before the, these new woke ideas of mental health or these new woke ideas of women's rights or men's rights and children's rights and so on and so forth. But we realize the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, and the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about all these aspects. And this is the paradigm shift that we have to have as Muslims. We have been given, uh, we have been given a, a treasure like no other treasure. We have been given the blueprint to human psychology, to human anatomy, to human, um, to, to the way humans should, should behave and act in looking at the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, and looking at the deen of Allah. But to translate that, that statement that Jafar al-Sadiq says, he says, I am confused to the one who is saddened or who is depressed, how he has not seen or heard of the ayah and said, La ilaha illa, and truly there is no God except you. In, I am truly, I have truly uh, uh, transgressed against myself because I saw, I heard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commented right after and he says, the fa'ad is ta'jal, the, the right away is fastajabina lah. We answered his call, we answered his dua. And we, we brought him out of this depression, out of this sadness. And this is how we take the believers out of sadness and out of depression. And I want to pause quickly on this because we hear this so often, especially with some of our khutaba. They say, oh, if you feel this depression, oh, it must mean that you're far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is an incorrect statement. And the Sahaba understood that so beautifully. And when they had difficulty, the first person that they would run to, right away they would run to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa As if knowing that running to an expert is, is the right path to solving all our concerns, to solving all our problems. And this is something that many of us, there's a taboo almost in our, in, our, in our societies, in our communities, that, oh, you cannot go to a therapist. Oh, you cannot go to a psychologist. Oh, if you have a problem, keep it within. But this is not the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. On the contrary, they used to run to one another, to run to the person of knowledge and ask them. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of remembrance if you do not know. Right, So this is a reminder to all of us to have that paradigm shift in the way we look at our problems, in the way we look at our concerns. And the Prophet, saw, and, and the last comment I want to make before wrapping up, one of the, the things that we, many of us have faced and have, have fallen into is this trap that, that happened yesterday in the Middle Eastern world. Yesterday, for many of us that aren't aware, is the, the Middle Eastern Mother's Day. And when, when I saw this holiday, I always laugh every single year. It shocks me that every year we have one day where there's an emphasis on celebrating our mothers. And we see in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is the paradigm shift that we have to have, that we have to start doing as a community and realizing the value and putting things in the correct value. And that is truly what wisdom is, is putting the things in the correct value at the right time. That's when we are wise. This Mother's Day that we have, as if valuing our mother on one day a year is acceptable. And many of us that haven't spoken to our moms in an extended period of time, we use that day to call our mother. And the reason I wanted to comment on it is the Prophet wasallam teaches us and actually pushes, puts an emphasis to have a good relationship with your parents all throughout the year. And actually, when asked, one of the Sahaba wanted to ask, and he commented, trying to have this paradigm shift, trying to see the value of one's parents. 
he asked the Prophet وسلم, oh Messenger of Allah, if I wanted to give back my father the debt that he has given me. As if saying that, you know, my, my father has a haqq on me and I want to just repay him for that haqq that he's done for me. Is there anything that I can do? And the Prophet وسلم, talking only about the father, he says to find your father in a state of enslavement and to release him from that state, then and only then will you have freed your father. And this is for the father. There is no amount of, of, of debt that you can pay to forgive, to give your mother her haq. That the, the, the Sahabi didn't even ask because he realized the value of his mother. One, one tabi'i carried his mother during hajj and asked Abdullah ibn Umar, the famous Sahabi, have I repaid my mother for taking her to hajj? I've done, I've carried her through hajj. Did the tawaf, did the sa'a and marwa, went to arafa, carried my mother throughout the entire process. If I repaid her for, for what she has done for me. Abdullah ibn Umar showing him the value of his mother. He's saying, you have not even done one contraction's worth of payment to your mother. And our mothers have had many contract tens if not hundreds of contractions, depending on how difficult your birth was. To show us the value of our mother. And this is the paradigm shift that I want us all to continue to remember. To realize, to put things at the correct value. And we only can do that by learning the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And using it and implementing it in all aspects of our lives. Not just in salah, not just in siyam. And yes, those are important and those are crucial. And don't get me wrong. Yes, salah and siyam are, are, are tenets and pillars of our religion. But our religion is comprised of so much more, of our daily actions, of our interactions that we have with people, of our relationships that we carry day in and day out, of the way we speak to one another. And this, the Prophet wasallam, time and time again, he teaches us this in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam. And looking back at the original verse that we says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنٌ and truly, indeed, the Messenger of Allah, you have a good example. So if we don't know the example of the Prophet if we don't know his seerah, how can we follow in his example? How can we follow in, in his teachings if we don't know who he is or what he has done or how he has interacted with the people around him and the times that he was in? So what's our homework? And I want us to leave today before Ramadan with a homework. There's three things I want us to do. First and foremost, if you haven't had the opportunity to hear the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ this year, go out and listen to it. There are many sources online that you can hear. If you want to hear it in English, Abdul Nasir Jengda has a beautiful podcast, nearly 300 hours talking about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. If you want to hear it in Arabic, there's people like Sheikh Saeed Al-Kamari and Tariq Al-Suaidan, both on YouTube, both have it. In, in Arabic for those who want to listen to in Arabic. That's our first homework. And seeing and implementing all the lessons in our lives. While you're listening to the seal, don't think of it as a story, but think of it as a teaching for the way you live. So that's our first piece of homework. Our second piece of homework is making short-term and long-term goals. The short-term goals is what are we going to do this Ramadan? How are we going to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are we going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Rabb Ramadan? And how are we going to continue it after Ramadan is over? And try to do little things. Do something that you can continue even after Ramadan. And the third thing that we're going to do is change our intention, have that paradigm shift to change our intention, to realize that every action that we take, everything that we do is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can be rewarded in every second of our day, in every minute of our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to enter the highest level of Jannah. Jazakumullah khairan. And we will see you next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين respected wonderful brothers and sisters welcome again to Muslim do where they do a positive difference in your life ultimately leading to a positive outcome leading to the Jannah insha'Allah wonderful brothers and sisters today's reminder and the reminder benefit the believers so if you walk out of this
short talk with the reminder it means you have a with a benefit i mean it means you have a good heart to observe the teaching of allah and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi which is the elements of taqwa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the ingredients of taqwa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the major purpose of this wonderful guest that we're going to hug soon ramadan the major purpose of the fasting la'allakum tattaqun allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pinpointed this reality in the holy quran so you may achieve piety so you may achieve righteousness and let us understand and uh, analyze the meaning of taqwa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where imam ali bin abi talib radiyallahu an amir al mu'minin the giant did pinpoint the reality and the meaning of taqwa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying taqwa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it means four things الخوف من الجليل والعمل بالتنزيل والرضاء بالقليل والاستعداد إلى يوم الرحيل إمام علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه The giant did explain to us what does it mean تقوى الله سبحانه وتعالى We've heard تقوى الله سبحانه وتعالى so many times We read it in the Holy Quran so many times The greatest and the humongous purpose of fasting الصيام لعلكم تتقون So you may achieve تقوى So you may achieve piety and Righteousness. So, therefore, Imam Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh, said, Taqwa Allah means four things. Fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, implementing the Holy Quran, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us, means living the Holy Quran, practicing the Holy Quran, being content with the little things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. In reality, Allah gave us so many humongous things. The fourth matter, al-istadad ila yawm al-rahil. It means preparing for the long journey to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a great matter, but we need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to Imam Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh. So taqwa Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, it has that meaning, but also taqwa Allah, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So you may achieve piety. So this way you are actually not just abstaining from food and water for several hours, you are actually extracting that taqwa. You are lubricating your heart by abstaining from food and water that hidden ibadah, because it's a secret ibadah. Anyone can in the backstage drink and... Uh, Eat, nobody would see them. But this is a ibadatul qalb. This is actually worshiping Allah sincerely from our hearts by fasting to achieve that taqwa. Ultimately, to gain that taqwa. And the poet said, shows you that the big deal of taqwa, tazawwad min taqwa increase your taqwa. فَإِنَّكَ لَا تَدْرِي إِذَا جَنَّ لَيْلٌ هَلْ تَعِشْ إِلَى الْفَجْرِ Increase your taqwa. You don't know if a night comes that you could live till Fajr time. فَكَمْ مِنْ فَتَى أَمْسَى وَأَصْبَحَ ضَاحِكًا وَقَدْ نُسِجَتْ أَكْفَانَهُ وَهُوَ لَا يَدْرِي وَكَمْ مِنْ صِغَارٍ يُرْتَجَى عُمْرَهُمْ وَقَدْ أُدْخِلَتْ أَجْسَامَهُمْ ظُلْمَةَ الْقَبْرِ وَكَمْ مِنْ عَرُوسٍ زَيَّنُوهَا لِزَوْجِهَا وَقَدْ قُبِضَتْ أَرْوَاحُهُمْ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ وَكَمْ مِنْ صحيح مات من غير علة وكم من سقيم عاش حينا من الدهر The poet is urging us to increase our taqwa because my dear brothers and sisters respected brothers and sisters taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it can mix us or breaks us taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is in reality the one and only one would make you reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the qalb and salim with the sound heart so the poet urging us to increase our taqwa what? Yeah, to increase our taqwa. Increase your taqwa. You never know if you live Aisha time that you could reach Fajr time. How many youth day and night they are playing and they don't know their cuff and ready to hug them. How many infants we look at them and we aim for their long life. Soon their small body enters the darkness of the grave. How many brides they anointed her. They made her look good for her husband. Both of their soul collected in their wedding night. How many healthy people drop dead? How many ill people lived a long while? So taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a serious matter that really 
really lives in the heart. Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the place and the headquarter of Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is in the heart. So do we have a gauge? Do we have a gauge, a mechanism to measure Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer, yes. One of them, there's many. One of them, giving charity. Giving, bi sabilillah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, as-sadaqa burhan. Means when you give charity, it is a proof for your iman. And that iman actually motivated and activated by taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you give, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, giving charity, it's a proof. And that means a proof for your iman. And that iman actually generated, activated, motivated by taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are among those who gives fi sabilillah, not only you are a generous person, you actually have taqwa Allah in your wealth. You are fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your wealth. You are gaining the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your wealth. You are actually having a huge division between you and the hellfire by your generosity. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the rewards of taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the rewards, just one, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised in the Holy Quran to give you what's so-called hayatan tayyibah, a good life. You gain that good life by being kind, generous, doing good deeds for sabilillah. Ultimately, that's coming from a heart that has taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, what does it mean taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What does it mean? By the way, taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in reality, you are lubricating the heart. When you have that taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality, you lubricate the heart so you don't have a rigid heart. You don't have a heart that it is upside down. No goodness will go in it. Like a cup. When you take a cup and put it upside down, nothing will go inside. No. With taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your heart, your heart upside and the right side up. So therefore, it will absorb goodness and your heart in reality, not a shame of anything. What does that mean? If they split your heart open and everybody could see your heart and read in your heart, everything's about you, you are not a shame of anything. This is actually taqwa Allah as well. Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also means if they split your heart open and they take your heart downtown Toronto and everybody could read what's in your heart, you have nothing to hide. You are not ashamed of anything. This is also taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wonderful brothers and sisters. Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The gauge for taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. Taqwa Allah means being righteous, uh, having piety, but also Applying taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at your work with those who work for you. You are not dealing only in a firm, fair way. Firmness and fairness. Fairness, adil. Firmness means like shidda. No, you are not just dealing with firmness and fairness. You are dealing with mercy. When you deal with the people who work for you with mercy, that's part of taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though you are able to deal with firmness and fairness, that's not enough. You need to apply the element of rahmah, the element of mercy, and that's extracted from taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you are mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, taqwa Allah, Self-monitoring of the heart. Take a look at the sequence. Respected, wonderful brothers and sisters, take a look at the sequence. Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Self-monitoring of the heart, leading to self-accountability of the heart, leading to self-adjustment and discipline of the heart, ultimately gaining rid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this way, you will reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a qalbun salim. I repeat, taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, self-monitoring of the heart, 
leading to self-accountability, leading to a self-adjustment and discipline of the heart, gaining the love of Allah and gaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This way, your taqwa will be your ship, your ship to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the qalbun salim, with a sound heart. And this is very high status. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to gain this, my dear brothers and sisters. So wonderful brothers and sisters, taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't mean if somebody slap you verbally that you take an axe and hit them with, that you take a hammer and hit them with. Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means that you let go. You let go. This is out of taqwa. Even though you have right, this is actually easy to say, but you are a strong person if you have taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let go and forgive those who wronged you. So my dear brothers and sisters, let us realize taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan to help us reach next Ramadan, refill us, refill us, recharge us to reach next Ramadan with a better taqwa, with a higher taqwa. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to have the fasting, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So you may achieve piety. So you may achieve righteousness. So you might be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a nutshell, having taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Gaining, maintaining taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan, it means you have a positive change in your life. Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah does not change the situation of people unless they change what's within themselves. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, Ramadan is a matter of a change. The change starts in the heart, in the intention, and this way, you gain taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this one minute or less that I have left with this reminder and the reminder benefit respected brothers and sisters like yourself, I would say, if you forget this whole talk, realize Ramadan, it's an opportunity to make a change, to make an overhaul to your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make a positive change in your heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that positive change in your heart, Allah will give you a higher level, a better taste in this life, in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us with taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the qalb and salim and make a positive difference. We enter Ramadan and we graduate from Ramadan with a positive difference with taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah keep loving you. Stay blessed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. Ala rasulillah. Ikhwan al-Ikhwan al-Kiram. Mutabihi Muslim Do. Ahlan wa marhaban bikum fi halaka jadida min durus min alam al-siyasa. Halaka al-yawm inshallah. Brakkiz fiha ala qadiyat al-ahzab wa aqidat al-ahzab. Hal al-ahzab aqida ta'amal bimuqtadaha في عملها السياسي وهو هذا العرف أو المتعارف عليه أن على سبيل المثال الحزب المحافظ هو حزب محافظ في عقليته أي يريد أن يحافظ على الهيئة الأولى للبلاد ويرفض أي تغيير أو أي قادم جديد وبالمقابل الحزب الليبرالي من المتعارف عليه أنه هو حزب منفتح على الجميع ومنفتح على الآخر ويستوعب الجميع ويرحب بالجميع فهو أكثر قبولا وأكثر استيعابا وأفضل خيارا للقادمين الجدد إذا الحزب المحافظ يمثل اليمين المتعصب المنغلق على نفسه والحزب الليبرالي هو يمثل اليسار المنفتح ويفتح الباب على مصراعين هل هذا الكلام ما زال صحيح أو يبقى صحيحا هل هذه العقيدة السياسية أو المبادئ السياسية هي مبادئ فعلا ثابتة أم هي متغيرة هذا موضوع خلقتنا اليوم أول شيء يجب أن نعلم أنه 
أي مبادئ في الحياة غير مربوطة في عقيدة ربانية راسخة ثابتة فهي لن تكون ثابتة أبدا ستتغير مع المصالح وتتغير مع الأهواء وتتغير مع الظروف وهذا شيء واضح وعليه كثير من الأدلة في تاريخ البشرية ما الذي يثبت ولا يتغير من عقائد لا شيء غير ما يرتبط بصلة وثيقة بالله سبحانه وتعالى هو الذي يبقى ثابت وما دون ذلك وهو متغير إذا هذه العقائد التي ذكرناها هي عرف متعارف عن الأحزاب ولكن يجب أن نؤمن أنها غير ثابتة أدلل على ذلك على سبيل المثال في الحزب الليبرالي الحزب الليبرالي عرفنا وابتدى أنه حزب متحرر منفتح على الجميع وحزب يقبل الآخر ولكن ما نرى اليوم من صرفات الحزب الليبرالي هو أنه مال كل الميل لفئة معينة شريحة صغيرة من المجتمع ألا وهي شريحة الشواذ وبدأ يسخر كل طاقاته وكل جهوده لخدمة هذه الشريحة ولو على حساب الشرائح الأخرى هو أصبح يتعصب بالفعل لشريحة واحدة في المجتمع على حساب الشرائح الأخرى والأدلة كثيرة من القوانين التي سنت ومن الآليات التي اتخذت في التعامل في على المستوى الحكومي وعلى مستويات أخرى حتى في التوظيف بدأت بعض الشركات الآن إلا يعني أو تستكشف قابلية المتقدم للطلب من العمل أنه هل هو مؤيد أو داعم لهذه الأمور وإن لم يكن فلن يعطى فرصة للعمل إذا أصبح الحزب الليبرالي حزب متطرف وحزب متعصب لفئة كما هو العرف عن الحزب المحافظ أن يكون متطرف و وأن يكون متعصب لفئة معينة هي الفئة فئة القادمين أو المهاجرين الأوائل أو الأقدم ولكن اليوم إحنا بنقول أنه هذه الأمور تتغير هذه ليست ثوابت ما تعلمناه في السياسة في كندا أن عقيدة الحزب مرتبطة فعلا بقيادة الحزب ويتحقق هنا القول المشهور عند العرب أن الناس على دين ملوكهم فعلا تتطبق أو تتحقق هذه المقولة بشكل كبير في الأحزاب التي نراها في كندا وأعتقد أن هذا ينطبق على العالم الغربي كله لأنه هو يتبع نفس النهج بالعمل السياسي فالناس على دين ملوكهم فإذا أتى قائد حزب معتدل يعتدل الحزب معه وإن أتى قائد حزب متطرف يتطرف الحزب معه وهذا ما يعني يعني يدعونا كمجتمع أن ننتبه لقضية في غاية الأهمية ألا وهي المشاركة في انتخابات قيادة الحزب موضوع خطير جدا 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 طريقة المسلمين والمجتمع المسلم والمجتمع العربي في التعامل مع السياسة والأحزاب كانت لفترة طويلة من الزمان تبتدئ يوم الانتخابات أو خلال الحملة الانتخابية العامة هنا تبتدئ النقاشات وتبتدئ المفاوضات وتبتدئ النقاشات عن مطالب المجتمع المسلم وحقوقه ومن ثم نجد أنها لا تتحقق هذه المطالب فهناك وعود انتخابية ووعود سياسية وشعارات انتخابية ولكن بعد الفوز من الانتخابات تجد أن هذه المطالب لا تتحقق بل على العكس تهمل إهمال شديد وهذا ما رأينا على مر السنوات الطويلة التي شاركنا فيها في العمل السياسي ويتضح لنا أن الطريقة المثلى لانتزاع الحقوق هي عبر المشاركة في الانتخابات القيادية للحزب يعني يجب أن نكون موجودين في الأحزاب يعني يجب أن نشترك في في عضوية الأحزاب وهي عضوية مفتوحة لجميع المقيمين بغض النظر إن كنت مواطن أم مقيم كل المقيم على أرض كندا له الحق أن يشترك في عضوية الأحزاب من سن 14 سنة فما فوق ومع هذه المشاركة يحق لك التصويت في انتخابات القيادة 
وهنا تأتي المفاوضات الحقيقية في مع من يرشح نفسه لقيادة الحزب وهنا تأتي القوة الحقيقية في التأثير على قيادة الحزب ومن ثم التأثير على سياسة الحزب ككل والآن نحن بصدد أنه نشارك في انتخابات قيادة الحزب المحافظ بعد ما قام الحزب المحافظ إن شاء الله يعني أفصل في هذه القضية في الحلقة القادمة بعد ما قام الحزب المحافظ بإسقاط قائد الحزب السابق الآن هو أسقط بسبب فشل في الانتخابات السابقة هناك انتخابات جديدة وهي الانتخابات الثانية خلال سنتين لقيادة الحزب المحافظ هناك فرصة عظيمة يجب على المسلمين وعلى العرب أن يقتنصوها في هذه الانتخابات القادمة ويعني يميز هذه الانتخابات وجود مرشحين من طرفي المعادلة واحد متطرف جدا وواحد معتدل جدا فهي فرصة مناسبة وفرصة ذهبية لا تفوت أن نشارك في هذه الانتخابات ونصبح أعضاء في الحزب المحافظ حتى يكون لنا القدرة على المفاوضات أن نفاوض من نريد أن ندعمه وإن نجح هنا فعلا نحقق المكاسب السياسية فالفوضات الحقيقية والتأثير الحقيقي في السياسة في كندا بشكل خاص وأحسب أنه نفس القضية في دول الغرب هي تبتدئ من هنا المشاركة في الأحزاب والمشاركة في اختيار قائد الحزب في الحلقة القادمة إن شاء الله نتكلم عن تفاصيل أكثر عن الحزب المحافظ وكيف تم خلع قائد الحزب أو تغيير قائد الحزب مرتين هذه ثاني انتخابات خلال سنتين وما هي المكاسب التي يمكن أن يحققها المجتمع المسلم في المشاركة في هذه الانتخابات إلى لقاء متجدد إن شاء الله نراكم على خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته